Well, the Toronto Blue Jays were able to secure a victory over the New York Yankees. But to be fair, is a little bit of a Mickey Mouse victory. You are Locked On Blue Jays, your daily Toronto Blue Jays podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to Locked On Blue Jays. Thank you for making Locked On Blue Jays your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I'm a huge fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. Well, Carter, I'm not going to lie. I was happy with the win. Of course, I was at work. I did a, actually a segment on CGOB today talking about uh, the Blue Jays, and they happened to get the win. It was a bit of a Mickey Mouse victory in the sense that I don't know if they necessarily deserved it. But before we get into that, you guys can follow us on Twitter, Braden Fabi Wasco, Carter First Two, as well as check out our Instagram and TikTok at Locked On Blue Jays, as well as drop a subscription here on YouTube or if you're listening all over. Uh, we appreciate that. Yeah, but drop that subscription. It really helps us out, keeps us at the top of your guys' page. Uh, yeah, Carter, I don't know. How did you feel? Did you feel like this was a Mickey Mouse victory as well, or was it just a me thing? I'm going to start with the hitting because the pitching on the Toronto Blue Jays is usually the exact same. You usually don't have to worry about it. So hitting side, four hits against the Yankees. Luis Hill is actually how it's pronounced. I I saw that, obviously watched the first game we played the Yankees. But I mean, for me with the Yankees, there's so many teams, so many players that come in. It's Luis Hill. Like it's the Yankees fifth starter. Not overly worried about him. But yeah, it's the G-I-L, pronounced Hill. Interesting. But as for him, he struggled a little bit in the first couple of innings. And the Toronto Blue Jays, in typical Toronto Blue Jays fashion, cannot score runs, cannot hit with runners in scoring position. In the first inning, you get two walks in a row. You get Springer Vladdy, first and second. Ground ball by Bo. Probably should have been a double play ball. He beats it out. Then you get, I think it was a Turner pop out or a Turner strikeout. Can't remember exactly what happened. But it was an out, didn't advance the runners. And then Bo Bichette gets picked off at one. Like, what are we doing? It's just like, this is a Vladdy moment again from the playoffs. It's like, are you, why are we making these dumb mistakes getting picked off in big situations? You have a first inning, you have an opportunity, again, to take out a team, to kill a team early on in the game, and you get picked off at two. And we go into the second inning. You have bases loaded with no outs. IKF does work that walk. But then you have a strikeout from Kevin Kiermeyer. You have George Springer. Luckily, he throws the ball to the backstop. You get another run there. Those are your two runs. You don't get a hit from your two runs. That's not how you scored them. You got lucky, and then you got a walk. And then you get a Springer ground out and a Vladdy ground out. You have so many opportunities to get these guys in, and you're just not doing it. We go to the third inning. What was Sheck gets on? He's at second. While it's a 3-2 count, he steals on that pitch, Turner strikes out, whatever. You get, it's both Shets on second. You need to score this run. I'm like, I'm watching this game. I'm like, we just saw this same story happen two innings, lost two innings. We're not going to score this run again. Another strikeout. But then Kirk actually comes through and hits a double down the line. That is the Blue Jays' third run. But it's just, I'm not happy with three runs in this in this game. You have so many opportunities to score so many more runs and put the Yankees to bed after three innings. And you just don't do it. And it's just time after time again with the Toronto Blue Jays lineup. And it seems like in our comments section, I looked up uh, a lot of people on the, that Monday's video are like, this lineup is going to hurt this team down the stretch. It's already hurting this team. We're lucky to be over 500 right now with how this offense is playing. We're lucky that Chris Bassett is an absolute dog and we have such a great pitching staff because I don't know if we can go as far to say Mickey Mouse win because of how good our pitching staff was, but offensively, this was a horrible game again. Yeah, no, I, I, I classify that as a Mickey Mouse win. You you won half of the game and that was your pitching. The other half you were hand, hand gifted uh, and the, the gift was hand wrapped put under the tree, Santa delivered it and dropped it off for you because it was horrendous. The hitting was horrible. The at-bats looked terrible. I want to put this as a question to everybody listening. If you're on YouTube, leave us a comment. Tell me what, tell me if I'm in the ballpark here. Do we realistically think that the Blue Jays are a good enough team to be over 500 right now? And, And I want your honest opinions. If you guys believe that this team has been playing good enough for you to believe that they are an over 500 team. Fair enough. But in my books, me watching these games, this team should be nowhere close to 500 because they've been gifted at least two and possibly a third. And then the other, the, a few of the other ones are, are won by 
uh, Davis Schneider and Ernie Clement, who weren't even in the lineup again. Like, there, there's got to be some some thought process going into this. This is not a team with the lineup currently playing today that is going to win many ball games. But leave me a comment. Tell me if you think that they are justified of being over 500, or do you think this this is just a lucky stretch? And, and do you honestly think that we can keep this up for 162 games? So obviously you're coming from the standpoint that this team is not playing up to a 500 pace at oh, all. We're lucky. No, absolutely not. This is this is horrible. It's horrible to watch. I'm I'm getting frustrated. You you have the only way to win games is scoring runs. You, you you can't go and ask for your pitchers to only give up one run every single game. It's just not going to happen. Not consistently enough anyway. I mean, it, yeah, our starters have been great. They've been putting on a show. But then PBO off games like Kevin Gosman. Ooh, maybe an off game we'll see but um you know you can't ask for that every day and when you leave so many runners in scoring position that's going to kill you and you were gifted some of those runners in scoring position it wasn't like you worked for half of them you, you got walked put some balls in play hit the baseball i don't want to see if i see one more ground in a double play i'm gonna run through my wall legitimately head first through my wall because the ground balls into double play situations has been just horrible. And it seems like every time we have runners in scoring position, what happens is, is that somebody grounds into double play or a situation where they should be double plays. And I don't know. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled that they got the win. I, I want to be excited for this team. But like after watching games like this, I'm like, holy moly, like this can't this can't continue. Well, I mean, just looking at the lineup today, you had four hits up and down the lineup. Obviously, there was some more walks mi mixed in there. Some of them are earned, obviously, but some of them heal, just uh, cannot find the strike zone. When your best hitter of the season, it's good to see, but Alejandro Kirk, again, struggled like the, enti uh, the entirety of the season, let's be honest. He hasn't been good at all. But today, he was probably the best hitter on the Toronto Blue Jays. So maybe that's a good thing. You can spin zone that. I mean, Kirk, oh, it's nice to get him some at-bats, finally having pr some production. But you have four hits. Kirk has two of them. That's not something you can rely on up and down your lineup. I think uh, as for the 500 argument, I think it, it depends how you view this offense because the pitching staff is so good. They're good. The floor for the Toronto Blue Jays is so high because your pitching staff is so good. It's just more and more watching this this lineup. It, it It's tough. It's tough to watch. It's tough to watch time and time again when you have all these opportunities to score runs and then just time and time again getting these ground balls, getting these infield pop-ups, getting these strikeouts in big situations where this game could have been like eight to one if we just had timely hitting. And it sucks because it seems like we never get the timely hitting. And never it, when we have like bases loaded with no outs, it never even seems like we can get a sacrifice fly. Like even just a simple something to the outfield, get one run instead of relying on a walk or something like that, which walks I'm going to take every day of the week with bases loaded. It's just, again, it's not something you can rely on. It's something that usually is due to the pitcher's command but going funky in that inning. So, again, obviously in the comments, I've been seeing that people are not happy about this Blue Jays lineup. I'm not either. How do you fix it? Obviously, the number one thing is they just have to play better. There's you got to expect your guys to play better. But at some point, we've been saying this the last year and a half, it feels like, and it's not getting a whole lot better. I mean, there are some people that are hitting well. I think Kevin Biggio is having some yeah. of the best at-bats on this team. Obviously, Justin Turner woke up this morning. Who's leading the league in batting average? Justin Turner. Are you kidding me? This guy is probably one of the only bright spots on this offense uh, for this offense. Vladdy's at-bats are okay, I guess. I actually like George Springer the way he's playing. He's not really putting up the stats, but I don't mind his at-bats. For me, I don't know if you're seeing this as well, but Bo Bichette and Vladdy, those two especially, I don't know if it's because I the spotlight's on them a little bit more, but if it's a slider low and outside of them, it, you might it's, as well. It, it's it is right horrible. Everything. You are 100%. You are 100% right. They are, the, the swings and misses are, like, you know, it, it's different if you're swinging and it's a competitive hack, but they're going up there. And it, again, I always bring this up. I'm going to use the MLB The Show quote, but it's you're swinging a garden hose up there, and that's legitimately what it looks like. They're off balance. They're on one foot, like almost spinning around. Like, what's going well, on? They're, just, they're throwing – it looks like they're throwing the bat at the ball, and they're th swinging at sliders usually, and they're on. They're starting off the plate. They're swinging just off yeah. the plate, and then obviously they're breaking way off the plate. And then Bo and Vladdy seem to just be throwing their bat at the ball, obviously not even getting close to this pitch. And these are the guys that are hitting with runners in scoring position. And when you have swings like this and you get down in counts, 0-2, 1-2, Bobochet is a great two-strike hitter. But are you going to tell me that Bobochet's a better 1-2 hitter than he is in a count where he can be 2-0, 3-0?
Definitely not. So if you could actually work counts in your favor, get in 2-1, 3-1, 2-0 counts, get some better pitches to hit, I think that would probably help this team manufacture more runs instead of swinging at junk, getting down 1-2, and then having to battle back and try to just put something into play. Well, you know what? You, I, I think we've hammered enough. I've been upset enough so far at the start of this episode. There, there is bright spots. There, there is bright spots. And I think a little bit of me wants to try to dial into those. I think the big one is Danny Jansen returning. That's that's a huge, huge boost. I think he might be a, a bit of a spark plug here. And I, and I really hope that that's the case. Um, I don't know. Do you sort of have that same feeling that he might be a little bit of a, the key here? I don't know. I think that's maybe why Kirk got two hits today. He felt that Jano presence being back. He knew uh, some of his play time was going to be cut in too. So Kirk decided to uh, actually show up today. But no, I think uh, I think you're right. I think Jano is very much needed in this lineup, especially with that pop he has from the right side. Jano, I always say his pull side home runs, him, Vladdy, and Varsho. For me, those are the top three for pull side home runs because when they get a hold of the ball, it flies and it's so fun to watch. Jano, we need him at this five, six spot in this lineup. It seems yeah. like this kind of a black hole around there in the lineup when you don't have Kevin Biggio, David Schneider, Ernie in. And for some reason, you're not really getting a lot of playing time from those guys, it seems like. So it seems like they're really relying on IKF, which has so far worked out. You can't really complain about that too much. And then Kevin Kiermeyer. I mean, that's, you're, you're, I always go over Kevin Kiermeyer. I can't get that mad. I know what I'm going to get out of him. It's just John Schneider, when you have, an offense that is struggling and you're not putting in your young guns that have shown they are have more upside and are better hitters than some of these other players it's tough to fathom why john schneider is just lacking to put these guys in i get you don't want to put kevin kiermeyer on the bench for three straight days you don't want to put ik off on the bench for three straight, straight days whatever but when davis schneider and ernie clement are raking and they're having these amazing days especially with uh i think ikf was one they had he had Two amazing. Oh, sorry, it was Varsho. They sat. Varsho had two back-to-back home runs, and then you don't play him the next game, and you play Kevin Kiermaier. I just, I, I just don't get it. Like you have a guy struggling, finally finding his footing, back-to-back games with home runs, and you decide to go with 34-year-old Kevin Kiermaier. Just let let Dalton Varsho hit. Maybe he finds something. Maybe this is how he resurrects his season and starts hitting for average, starts hitting for power, and maybe fixes that black hole spot you have with five, six, seven in this lineup. Well, and and uh, yeah, I agree. But you, you said the bit about IKF, and and you can't be mad at what he's doing. I'm not thrilled with it. I I think his at bats, yeah, he's got a decent average in the past couple games, and and he's getting walks, and but the hits he's getting are garbage. He's having. I don't think the at bats are very good. I think, like you said about Vladdy and Bo throwing the bat at the ball, that's a little bit what IKF is doing too in his at bats. So I. I I think that's one of those situations where the numbers lie to us. I think when when we when we actually watch watch the at bats, it's not good. They're not they don't look he doesn't look good up there. And I'm I always say I, I said this when I was on uh, uh, the sports show tonight. Um, I'm a big eye test guy. The eye test is your best friend when it comes to baseball because stats like this, like IKF stats, they lie to you. And again, I don't want to be super negative all the time, but uh, but they don't look good. And I'm, and I'm not going to sit here and lie to, you, to anybody and saying like, like I made the Kevin Kiermaier take about his at bats looking good uh, about a week <laughs> ago. And then, and then the next for the next week, he was just the worst player of all time. So that's on me. I did that. Um, but I do Carter. I know we we've talked about the bat, right? They still did pick up the win today with a three to one defeat over the Yankees. And I want to focus in on a little bit of a good, a little bit of a crazy, a little bit of a psychopath in Chris Bassett, because that guy is all over the map. I love him. I love to watch him, but I do want to get more into him. But we're going to take a quick break here and then we'll get fully in onto the on this psychopath that is Chris Bassett. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. As you guys know, uh, me and Carter are both pretty competitive, so we've started playing Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's great twist on Monopoly where you can play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like in classic Monopoly. But now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me 
who the biggest monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in a time tournament to earn huge rewards. So get in on the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. Today's episode also brought to you by Game Time. As you guys know, I'm a huge supporter of Game Time. It's one of my favorite apps out there. I use it constantly to get all of my tickets. I'm actually going to a Vancouver Canucks game on Thursday here in Winnipeg. They play the Canucks play the Jets out here, and uh, it's it's perfect. I I can you know I they give you uh, like little red or green dots to see if your seats are really good. And I'm I'm taking my brother. My my parents are coming out, so. We're all going to go and watch that game. I'm really, really pumped and excited about that. And Game Time is the perfect place to use this app to buy the best tickets, best prices. They have zone deals, flash deals. Uh, also, the best part about it for me is the all-in pricing. I can see exactly what I'm going to pay before I go to the cart, so I know there's not going to be any surprise fees or charges. Uh, and the seat view is great as well, so I can go in and actually look at exactly my seat and see, you know, if it's a you know, hopefully I know in some MLB parks, there's like pillars and, and other things there that block your view. So it's nice to have that on game time as well, which I'll be using when we go to the Canucks game or to the uh, Blue Jays games as well. They also have the lowest price guaranteed game time will credit you hundred and ten percent of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the game time app and create an account and use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N M L B. For $20 off, download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Holy Carter, I haven't done two ads in a while. I'm like, my mouth's parched. I almost need a drink or something. Yeah, back to back. Auctioneer, Braden coming out. Uh, there we go. Maybe a career path you can look into if uh, this podcasting stuff doesn't work out. I already talk enough with radio and and uh, the podcast. I don't know if auctioneering on top of that is good for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be I'm- out of a voice by age 35. I don't know if people want to hear you that much already, too. You already have this platform with the podcast. I don't know if they want to hear you spitting out some auctioneer uh, terms over there with uh, when they're trying to make money off of some uh, some storage war units. So, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, before we get into the pitching, I just wanted to uh, quickly respond to what you said about that IKF and his at-bats. For sure. Um, with, with that, with IKF, honestly, I don't really care if his at-bats are good or bad. He's producing. So we're, that's something we're not getting from this offense. It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care about that. I don't care about if he's looping every single ball into the outfield. IKF is getting production. He's getting singles. I don't care how he's doing it. At the bottom of the order, if it's gritty and it works, go for it. I'd rather have IKF go one for four with a bloop single than Bo Bichette have three good at-bats and go over four. I, I strongly, strongly disagree. I think that as long as guys are putting good at-bats, in, in the overall, you'll eventually see things even out correctly. But if but you you can't expect IKF to have four terrible at bats, get a hit, and then expect that for the rest of the season and in big moments. At least if if it was Bo Bichette or Vlad having good at bats, but you know possibly getting the strikeout or whatever it is, and I think over time you'd rather have that at bat in a big situation than a, maybe a lucky, you know, hope hoping for a lucky hit by IKF in a big situation. Maybe, maybe over time, and that Bo Bichette example might not have been the greatest uh, comparison. Maybe if I would have used like uh, Ernie Clement, something like that. Ernie Clement having four good at-bats and not getting production. But with it, in a time where this offense is not producing anything at all, if you can get any hits at all, if you can like another IKF loop single, we had four hits today. That's one more hit. That's 20% of our hits, 25% with the four hits. So again, if, if we're getting anything, I, I, I do get where you're coming from, but I'm taking any offense at this point. Yeah, I I get, I get I do understand where you're coming from. Uh, yeah, and and I think I'm just looking at it for a more long term thing, not as not as much of a right now. So I do understand because um, it was frustrating. It's frustrating not to see anything happen. At least you're right. At least with an IKF hit, you get some type of action, if you want to say. Um, but yeah, in the in the long term, I I have to. I I can't be seeing these at bats all year long. I just can't. It's gonna hurt my soul. I think. Like I'm, I'm I might fall out of love with baseball. If I have to keep watching IKF have terrible at bats, IKF and Kevin Kiermaier together with the Bo Bichette and Vlad's garden hose swings, so somebody's gonna have to like watch out for the big balcony somewhere because it might maybe, be me. Maybe leave some comments on that as well. I don't. For you, you think you're completely in the dumps on IKF. I think IKF has been definitely better than expected. I don't think his at bats have been that bad. I, I mean, there's been a couple. Like there's a couple today that weren't great. 
But overall, I think IKF has been a lot better than I expected. So uh, comment whether you're uh, more on my side or more on Braden's <laughs> side about IKF and how you feel about that. Let's go into the dog of the day, the hound on the mound, Chris Bassett. Again, me and you both predicted a win because we knew this was going to happen. We knew Chris Bassett is a quality start machine. So let's go over the stat line here. Six and a third innings, four hits, one earned run, two walks, five Ks, 97 pitches. I mean, with Chris Bassett, you see Kikuchi, Jose Brios, if you see them pitch the first inning and you see them have their, their stuff, just write them down, six innings, one run. Might as well just like, if we're trying to save time in the MLB, let's just skip over that. Don't even let them pitch. But as a fan, I definitely want to see Chris Bassett absolutely shove against the Yankees. But if you're on a time crunch, I mean, we all know it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, no. And you know what? Chris Bassett might be one of my favorite guys to talk about because he is, he is, he's the hound on the mound. That is just sums it up so perfectly. He might be a psychopath. I'm con- I'm not quite convinced that he's a completely sane person, um, but I love it. But I love it. It's entertaining. It's fun to watch. He's getting mad at himself after giving up one hit today. And the the, the craziest out of all this is, so I was getting ready for the, the sports show today, you know, just trying to have some some stuff to talk about. We talked Blue Jays. I, I didn't want to just go off the cuff a little bit, you know, as I do on the podcast. I can't be as loosey-goosey. Um, and so I find a Chris Bassett article talking about all the pitcher injuries, which I think is so huge right now in conversation across the entire league with all these stars being out. Chris Bassett sort of throws a wrench into what I want to call the media spin right now. The media spin is that this is an epidemic. Players are going out, blah, blah, blah. And Chris Bassett's like, whoa, 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 let's pump the brakes a little bit here. And I like it. He said, we got to stop the finger pointing is is like the big, <laughs> that was like the headline. Stop the finger pointing. Um, of course, uh, if you, I don't know if a lot of you remember when Chris Bassett was with the Oakland Athletics in April of 2020, in 2016, not 2026. He actually was chasing higher, higher, higher velo and injured his elbow. So he understands coming from an injury perspective off of this. And he, he does see that the pitch clock might be an issue. That's what everybody's saying is that the pitch clock's a huge issue. It's injuring players, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. The biggest part of this is, and, and the statistics actually look, again, I say I'm not a big statistic guy, and then I always bring out the statistics. So whatever. Um, it actually says that the pitcher injuries are pretty average in comparison to past years at this time of year, it just so happens that it's a lot of these, uh, you know, big name stars that are getting injured. And Chris Bassett actually s- says it perfectly in the sense that it's the, um, the stars are getting injured because they're all chasing high and higher velos and the workload that they're putting on themselves to get these velos are so, so crazy. What they're doing is that they put themselves in a risk of an injury. So, at the end of the day, this is on the players. Yes, the pitch clock has a little bit to do with it. It's it, You don't have that little bit of recovery time. But the biggest component to this is the players doing it to themselves, wanting to chase that higher velo. When Chris Bassett, you look at some of his stuff, he, he doesn't throw crazy hard because he knows what can happen. And I think that's a huge piece here that not a lot of people are looking at is that you know we've, we've, we've come away from a time where it's you, you don't need the most filthy stuff anymore. You just need to throw hard. At the end of the day, Chris Bassett, I think, is the polar opposite to that. He doesn't throw super, super hard, but he has nasty stuff, and it's working out well for him. So I don't really understand why they're going towards this higher and higher velo situation. Um, I don't know. I I thought it was a very cool article. It's a very good read. Shai Davidi put it out. Go give it a read. I I don't want to go over the whole thing. There's a lot of little pieces in there, Uh, but I I really, really suggest uh, going and giving uh, Shai Davidi's – article a read it's 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 really good and actually me and uh, Skylar Peters who's been on this podcast we sort of went over it together today a little bit on the sports show and I think it's a it's just a really really solid read I know Carter and me were giving it a chat before the podcast and it sort of took us down to a couple different routes I know that, uh, that then we started getting on to Tim Mesa Carter so I, I do want to first ask you what you thought about Jose, uh, Chris Bassett's comments on this and then I'll, and then I'll let you throw it over to Tim Mesa. Yeah, so obviously we'll start with Chris Bassett. I think Chris, one thing Chris Bassett does really well is he always talks about his spring training routine and off-season routine. So with Chris Bassett, he's usually not ramped up with his below because he usually sits around 90, 91 with his fastball. It's nothing crazy, obviously, but his command and his stuff is disgusting. That's why he's very good. But with Chris Bassett, he's a guy that's not ramped up early on spring training, and that's due to saving his elbow. He wants to be have the longevity. He wants to be 
healthy the entire season. He doesn't want to be injured halfway through the season. Doesn't want to have elbow, elbow discomfort because usually with pitching, as soon as you have a little bit of dif- discomfort, stiffness usually lingers on for quite a while. So with Chris Fassett, that's not one thing is that all these pitchers are trying to get ramped up so early, trying to make teams, stuff like that, especially from these not uh, established guys. When you look at Ricky Tiedemann, he was throwing 97 in February when Chris Bassett was throwing like 85. Another thing why pitchers are chasing this velo so much is because they uh, you have more of an ability to throw mistakes. Whereas you're throwing 91 right over the middle, that's probably going to be sent to Mars. When you're throwing 101 over the middle, it's definitely a lot harder to catch up to. So that's why all these pitchers are chasing this velo. But then when you're doing velo days three, four times a day, throwing as hard as you can with all this load and not as much recovery, you can definitely tell how this is going to impact elbow injuries. But just before you get into to Tim Mesa, because I know I know that's where we're headed here. Um, but I, I just a little story here. So um, and I and I think this comes back to the sense of these these longer injuries. Um, as kids now, when they put kids through baseball. Uh, if they want to go play AAA, and this isn't in all areas, but it is in some, they make you now go and play your house league as well. And I think that this is a cancer to this to, to baseball. And I think this is going to injure kids long term. I know uh, when I played, obviously, I, I went through the same thing. And where you were pitching every day, so I was pitching for high school, I was pitching for AAA, I was pitching for uh, your single A club team as well. And because the, the the pitch count doesn't carry over, or people don't really tune into it, so a lot of coaches get away with playing the same pitcher in every of these teams. And I, I even found myself, uh, th- there was games where I couldn't feel my arm. I was, I was throwing my arm and I didn't throw hard. I wasn't, I wasn't a heat. I wasn't throwing heat. Right. I was, uh, I, it was just stuff. And even myself, and, and I've never had arm problems in my entire life. I've been very, very lucky with that playing baseball in my life, never had any issues, but it got into that where, where I noticed I was playing for three different teams and you, you start to feel it. Then you're even in the infield and you're like, holy moly, I can't, I don't know if I can get the ball over there because your arm's just dead. And and, and you, as kids, you're not pitching necessarily, um, you know, three or four innings. And then you say, my arm's tired. You're pitching until the pitch count tells you you're done because, uh, you know, some teams, you know, when you got a better guy on your house team, you're going to use them. You have to, that's part of the game. Coaches want to win. Players want to win. Um so it, I think it's just this isn't good for kids at the end of the day, right? Coming up through having to play all these games, getting used like this. I think this sets a bad standard. And now people even chasing higher and higher velos. I, I think this isn't good for the kids that play in baseball, you know, in their house leagues and stuff like that. This just isn't a good look. Well, when you're looking at it from the major leagues down to these kids in house leagues, 10, 12 year olds, whatever, everyone chasing these velo and they're sacrificing their mechanics to throw hard. And that's a yeah. huge thing as well. As, yeah. as well as when you have these younger kids, they're trying to separate themselves from the pack. Whereas growing up, you obviously don't want to throw curveballs as much. The off speed with your developing arm, it's definitely not going to be the greatest for it. But with all these guys now, I'm, I don't know how it is. I'm obviously not at 10 year old baseball games, but I'm assuming <laughs> there's probably a lot of kids going on YouTube seeing Jose Barrios throwing an, an unbelievable slurve. And they're like, I want to do that. And they're probably practicing this and they're probably throwing all these off speed pitches. It probably isn't necessarily good for their arm. Arm And when they're 10 years old and they're throwing 45 miles per hour anyway, it's probably more on location and command as we see throughout the major leagues as well. It's not all about velo. It's mostly about your command. If you can locate a good fastball, that's probably going to do you a lot better than throwing that five miles per hour harder. But anyway, but this is a whole tangent. We yeah, you know what? I, to, I, 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 I did want to apologize a little bit. It's just this was like a, a major story, I think, going on in the league. And we've talked about it a ton at work. Actually, I think... Uh, we have one of our reporters actually doing a full piece on sport injury and stuff like that. And and just as a person that loves the game and, and not wanting to see these big time injuries, especially due to the stars, um, it, I think it's something that's very important to talk about. And I think that looking at a bunch of different angles on this is important. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring it to you. It's sort of just lingering a little bit. And this is a perfect place to let stuff out And when you have these kind of ideas. So. Well, we say this all the time as well. We never want to see superstar players injured. These superstar players, Shohei Otani, Aaron Judge. I mean, you could throw Vladdy in there, 2024 MLB cover athlete. So you have all these guys. They're bringing people to the game. They're bringing kids, adults, whoever it is to the game. It's You're losing viewers. The game's not as good. And obviously, you never want to see anyone get injured on a baseball field. You want to see the best talent out there possible. 
So I didn't want to get into Tim Meza, but I think I'm going to leave that for the third segment now, just based off of our time. But before we head to the third segment, I did want to bring up that our Locked On 24-7 streaming service is offering an NFL mock draft segment on April 17th at 7 p.m. They go into team needs, some fantasy stuff, which I'm big into. Uh, I would be more into the first round, but my Panthers don't have a first round pick. So if you're a Bears fan, especially Vikings fan, whatever it is, first round NFL draft is always nice to see because these players make an immediate impact. So it's a perfect opportunity to get expert analysis on all your favorite NFL teams. Just go over to the Locked On 24-7 streaming channel, or it's also offered on the Amazon Fire TV channel for the Locked On. Just go over there and get all your information on the NFL draft. And we're going to get into Tim Meza and the Yankee series after this. Are you struggling to close deals? Selling is tougher than ever, and that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Fueled up by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date, first-party data enabling you to unlock conversations with people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That's linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. Quick question for you. Well, um, was that, I don't know if that sponsor was in. No, it was, it was linkedinsales.com slash locked on. I just wanted oh, okay. to make sure. So Okay, yeah, just in case anybody didn't catch that. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I didn't say it very often. I didn't say it much. So uh, it was very easy to go over your head. So good thing uh, we got that out there. Okay, I, so uh, I, yeah, I'll, sorry. I'll, I'll I, you know what? I just want to say again, let me know what you guys think about. I, I'm sorry about those tangents. I just think it's such an interesting topic. Let me know if you guys find it just as interesting or if you like some of those tangents that I go on. I don't know. Um, but I, I think it's very something very prevalent. Let me know what you guys think about just that whole topic in general in the comment section. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you got kids or, or you are maybe playing college, high school ball, something like that, let us know if you guys are seeing sort of the same stuff going on as well. It, I, th- I think it's a very interesting conversation. But Carter, I've put it off long enough. Can I please hear about Tim Meza, please? Yeah, so Tim Meza, obviously not the best start of the season. I believe his ERA is around a 10 right now. After today, it might be a little bit better because he did have a pretty good performance again today. Two-thirds innings, no hits, no walks. I mean, you're definitely taking that from Tim Meza. But I think there is a reason reasoning for his struggle. So with Tim Meza, this guy is the epitome of consistency, pretty much a, a 3-2 to 3-1 ERA over the last three seasons. So Tim Meza having, it was, I think it was like a 13 ERA at one point. I'm like, this, this isn't right. What like, something is off here and it's with his sinker. So his sinker is two miles per hour down, which it, it is a lot, but again, it's even more when Tim Meza is topping his sinker out at 93. So now this year it's been sitting around 91 miles per hour, which has impacted Tim Meza a ton because his command has lacked a little bit as well. So Tim Mason now is just throwing a 91 mile per hour slider right over the middle of the plate was getting hit a lot. So he tried to switch something up. So with Tim Mason, normally he throws his sinker about 75% of the time with the slider being 25% of the time this season, he's throwing the sinker 59.8% of the time with the slider of 40.2% of the time, 15% difference with a two pitch pitcher with Tim Mason sinker slider. I don't think you want to rely on the slider too much. It's more of just a mixed pitch because Tim Meza, his sinker moves a ton. And that's what makes it so good. Losing that two miles per hour. It's a little bit easier for players to hit. Not as confident in that slider. So people are sitting slider more often. You're sitting off speed pitch. You get an off speed pitch. Pretty easy to launch if you're waiting on it. Braden, do you think uh, this pitch mix and this slider sinker combo is the reason why Tim Meza is struggling a little bit this season? Yeah, you know what? That that's a great uh, pickup on your behalf because that's that's something very interesting too. Is hundred percent that's that's the reason why you if you're less con it, it's showing less confidence in that fastball and that's huge. And then to having to throw that slider as much, people are obviously just going to sit there. They're going to wait for that pitch, and because it's slower, because they know what it's going to do, that they'll they'll beat up on that. And I, I think you're on the money. That's exactly what's going on. See, and when I kind of compare this to like Trevor Richards, with Trevor Richards, he has that change up. His change up is his first pitch. His change up is his best pitch. He uses the fastball just as a, uh, 
switching speeds thing. And Tim Mays is the opposite. His sinker is his first pitch. His sinker just is to switch speeds. So when you don't have your best pitch in your arsenal, it's definitely going to impact your produ- productivity on the field. So Tim Mays, the last two starts, he's gone uh, an inning now and two thirds, hasn't given up a run, hasn't given up a hit in those two innings. So it, it does look better. Tim Mays, it is early on in the year. I just wanted to point that out as something I was looking out for. It's found it kind of interesting to start for Tim Mays' season. So one thing I did want to go into too as well, quickly, is just some updates. Braden did uh, bring this up on the podcast before. Danny Jansen has been called up, but in corresponding moves, that just means Brian Servan has been sent down to AAA. Filled his role. I mean, with the Blue Jays, kind of knew this was going to happen. I'm not too mad about Brian Servan's production. I think he, I don't know what his average was off the top of my head. I believe it was probably around 100, to be honest. Nothing crazy. But again, he's a third catcher. I'm not expecting a ton from Brian Servan. Kind of a nothing burger for me. Expected. Braden, you got anything else to add about that? Yeah, no, not at all. Actually, he's got a zero average. Oh, he doesn't even have a hit. I thought I was being generous and giving him one. I guess uh, he may- maybe it was a walk or something. So uh, yeah. thanks, Brian Servin. We might need you in the future. Hopefully not, because that means one of our catchers go down. But with Brian Servin as your third catcher, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to complain. Um, as for Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson, I got a quote from John Schneider from Ben Nicholson Smith. And John Schneider says that Swanson and Romano will be activated soon, in quotation marks, at which point Romano will close again. And it sounds like the plan may be tomorrow. So we might get our best two relievers on this team back tomorrow, which would be a huge bolster this bullpen. Obviously, two guys, two, uh, your closer and your normal eighth inning guy. So far, with them being gone, obviously, Jimmy Jimmy Garcia again today, great day. But just a bullpen that's already looking good, just having these two guys, huge bolster to the bullpen. Yeah, and, and speaking about tomorrow, I mean, you got Kikuchi versus Rodon tomorrow, which is a heavyweight matchup. That is going to be electric. And then if you can, you know, go from Kikuchi pretty much right into uh, Eric Swanson and then into Romano, I mean, the Jays might only need one run. Yeah, that is uh, a pretty dangerous uh, pitching staff for a day against the Yankees. So I got three more things to go into, and then we'll get more into that Rodon Kikuchi series. So Joey Votto, finally an update on him. Seems like he stepped on, I don't know if it was like a, like a metal bat with like spikes coming out of it. I don't know like what this bat, was, like what happened to his ankle, but the fact that he just fell off the face of the earth the last three weeks is kind of surprising to me. But Joey Votto, some hitting work, but no immediate plan for a rehab game. So again... <laughs> nothing concrete on Joey Votto. Are we missing him right now? I don't know. It depends if Joey Votto can hit baseballs. We got one night bat from him in spring training and he launched. So, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's not, not a big sample size on Joey Votto. I guess not a lot to say about that. Just got to see him actually play baseball. Alec Manoa slated for another triple A rehab start on Friday. And then Yariel Rodriguez, our dog, a guy that I'm going to be so excited to watch pitch again against the Padres slated for Friday. So before we get into Friday and focus on the Padres series, we still have a Yankee series at our hands. Got the first game of that series. Got game two tomorrow. And Brayden, I'll give it to you for a quick uh, pitching, pitching preview again. Yeah, so of course, you say Kikuchi pitching against Carlos Rodon. You say Kikuchi sitting at a 2.3 ERA right now. Just looks electric, but it's going to be a big test going against this Yankees lineup. As we always say, they have a really, really stacked lineup. They can hit the baseball. We all know that. So, uh, yeah, it should be a good test for him. He starts the season 0-1, which is not the best, but I don't think that's on him. Carlos Rodon starts the season 1-0 with a 1.72 ERA, which is pretty disgusting. But hopefully the Jays can figure out their hitting because it seems like you never know when they're going to turn it on. So maybe maybe I'll be wrong. I predicted a loss originally on this game, uh, even though I think Kikuchi is going to go out and have a good day. Um, the Jays just might not be able to score a run. So who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, I had the same thing. I had a loss for the exact same reason. Two guys, Kikuchi has success against the Yankees. Kikuchi is definitely not the problem. Carlos Rodon last season, the Yankees made a big move. Obviously didn't work out last season with some injury troubles. And then when he was healthy, he was just horrible. But again, it's one of those seasons where you're not healthy. It's one of those things where you're not really built up. You don't have a regular regular season. And it's tough to just kind of be thrown in when you haven't thrown any innings for like six months, right? So Carlos Rodon gets an actual spring training and his look good so far. I have the same thing as you. I think it's just the hitting today is going to impact him again tomorrow. It's not going to work out three runs if we even get three run, runs. I don't think uh, these Toronto bats are going to hit. Hopefully they prove me wrong. Hopefully yeah. we see some Fingers home runs. Crossed. Let's get to Carlos Rodon. Let's be the first team of the year to do it. But I'm not too confident in these bats. 
maybe David Schneider gets some playing time. I think Rodon is a right-hander, if I'm correct on that. So, I mean, that's not looking good for David Schneider playing time with uh, with Kevin Kiermaier being a lefty. But we need offense. Get Davis in the lineup. You got to keep IKF in. I think you got to keep Kevin Biggio in. Fortunate for Ernie Clement. Has cooled off a little bit since his hot start. So, I'm not mad, I guess you could say, uh, not playing Ernie Clement. But I'd rather have Ernie Clement in than Kevin Kiermaier at this point. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're you're bang on. Uh, this, you know, I, Carter. This has been a sort of a little bit off the wall podcast, a little bit. I think uh, I took this a little bit off the rails, but I hope you guys enjoyed. It's sort of something that has been on my mind a ton. Uh, I know every like everybody in our newsroom at, at work has been talking about the same thing. Just with all these injuries, it's it seems to be at the forefront of everything right now. Uh, and and for for good sake, I mean, it's you know all these teams are losing some of their best guys, so it's, it should be interesting. But I'm pumped to watch the baseball tomorrow uh jets play seattle so i will be there but uh good thing i have my extra little monitor and that i will be able to hopefully stream the game as well on there so i don't miss any bit of blue jays baseball but uh carter i don't know well i got at least one more thing to add and that's about our 24 7 streaming channel obviously we have that mock draft that is going on there but there's a ton of other things going on as well got the nhl playoffs right around the corner i think the last day is thursday if i'm correct with that for the regular season yeah yeah so we got that obviously the nfl draft college sports all this kind of stuff for obviously great expert analysis from locked on especially if you're looking for the basketball standpoint you're not going to get that here so you might as well go over there get some more basketball knowledge whether it's 7 a.m 7 p.m so you can go over the locked on sports channel today on youtube or amazon fire tv channels we have that locked on channel over there so it's the first ever national 24 7 streaming channel Braden, let's go win a series. I know you didn't have the Blue Jays winning, but obviously you're going to sacrifice your predictions for a Blue Jays win. I'll sacrifice is, my left arm for a Blue Jays win. If, if we win this game, I'm very confident going into tomorrow. I know you're not as confident in Kevin Gosman. I'm not worried about him. I think this is a prime bounce back opportunity for Kevin Gosman, especially if we can keep the momentum and get a win with Kikuchi. 100%. I'm with you. We really appreciate all you guys watching. Make sure you drop a subscription. Uh, here on youtube we really appreciate everybody listening on all the podcast sites that there is i don't know there's like a million of them now uh also follow us on twitter braden five wasco carter first two and check out our instagram and tiktok at locked on blue jays appreciate it we'll talk to you guys tomorrow because we're back every single day